Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our three-part heritage tourism workshop. My name is Caitlin Yeager. I'm director of heritage programs for Missouri Humanities. Our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. So our heritage tourism workshop is part of our cultural heritage workshop program dedicated to providing tools and resources necessary for communities to reevaluate cultural heritage assets, improve community involvement and increase tourism and economic development opportunities. We are about to jump into our third and final webinar of the day with Trish Ertzfeld, Executive Director of Perry County Heritage Tourism. Trish will discuss how one heritage tourism destination found strength within their rural county to develop their heritage tourism program by building, promoting, and identifying new resources and cultural heritage assets. If you missed either of our earlier programs today, they are both available on our Facebook page under the videos tab, and that page is Missouri Humanities Council. And they'll also, um, all three of these will be available on our YouTube page and our website probably sometime next week. So whether you are joining us through Zoom or watching on Facebook Live, we invite you to be part of the conversation. If you're on Facebook, feel free to comment to let us know you're watching or to ask questions for us to consider. If you're on Zoom, feel free to submit questions in one of two ways. You can either use the chat box feature or the Q&A feature. The Q&A feature is just your ability to type a question and submit it and it gets sent directly to me rather than being seen by everybody in the chat box. If you enjoy our program today and are interested in seeing more from Missouri Humanities, please check us out on Facebook or on our website for the most up-to-date information about our events. We also have a membership program, which is brand new to us. We started it last year, um, but it's been really successful. So we invite you all to participate in that. Benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to members-only events. To become a member, visit mohumanities.org and click Become a Member. At the conclusion of the webinar today, a survey will pop up on your screen. So as soon as I close down the webinar, you'll have a little pop-up that's a little survey link. So don't exit Zoom right away. Please click on that link and uh, take the time to let us know what you thought of the presentation. It's not too long, just a few minutes. Uh, these surveys are really important as we continue to bring public programming to Missourians and work toward a more thoughtful, informed, and civil society. So with all that, I'd like to turn this over to Trish Ertzfeld. She's Executive Director for Perry County Heritage Tourism and also a board member for Missouri Humanities, another wonderful board member doing wonderful things for, uh, for the state of Missouri and for our organization. So thank you so much for being here, Trish. And go ahead and let's talk about Perry County. Okay, well, thank you, Caitlin, and welcome everyone. I am, I'm really excited to be here and to share some of the things that I have learned while building our heritage tourism program. So. To give you a little bit of background, Perry County, Missouri is a county of less than 20,000 people. Nearly half of our population lives in Perryville, which is our county seat. Around 2014, the city of Perryville started to realize the tourism opportunities that uh, we were missing out on simply by not promoting what was unique and special about the area that we lived in. So in 2015, they made the decision to create the Perry County Heritage Tourism. There was a lot of conversation about who we were as a city, who we were as a county, what was special about us, what was unique. Um, and we kept coming back to our roots and our heritage. Like many of you, we didn't have an arch. We didn't have six flags. We didn't have a zoo, we didn't live on Route 66, but heritage really was our strength. And we knew that if we were going to be able to promote ourselves and to be sustainable, then we were going to have to focus on our heritage. So that is why we use heritage in our tourism name. Um, Now we are a very young tourism program. I was hired in May of 2015. And although I was born and raised in Perry County, I was certain that I didn't know everything about my community and what was expected of me to promote. Um, so what I did was is I took a really big map of our county and on my office wall, I pinned everything I could think of in terms of cultural sites, 
museums, natural areas, restaurants, wineries, breweries, boutiques, antique shops, um, whatever I could think of that was unique, special, or even odd, this was the beginning of my tourism inventory list. Now, when you make your inventory list, don't forget to, to make a calendar or a list of the calendar of your festival and seasonal events. In Perry County, we have the May Fest. We also have a great community fair. And we also have our seminary picnic, which is a, it's a huge Catholic picnic that is celebrating its 120th year in August. But you know, we still have those few smaller church picnics, you know, with the homemade dumplings and fried chicken or fried fish. They all have beer gardens and local bands, which make wonderful, authentic experiences for many. Um, we have the homemade pies, the homemade ice cream, and just being able to tour the, the local church there is a great social and cultural event. Um, we all have fancy stands. I guess that's what some of you guys may call them. Fancy stands, you know, um, where they have the homemade items, the canned and the baked goods uh, that are regional favorites from recipes that have been handed down from generations. Tell your local history through these items. Sometimes we take these small events for granted. Once you have completed your inventory list, look at what you have, and then you can identify what you don't have. Um, and then you can design a tourism guide. Now this doesn't necessarily mean a professional brochure, but it really does need to be something that you can share with people and use yourself. Because what are people going to ask you? They're gonna ask you, what is there to do? Where can we visit? Where can we stay? And then of course, where is there somewhere that we can eat? People will come and visit and stay if you give them a roadmap of where to go, what to do and where to stay. And we call this an itinerary. So make a day trip plan and an overnight schedule. So that if someone comes to you and asks, you can say, oh, I have the perfect plan for you to enjoy the entire day here, or you can do all of these things and maybe plan on staying two days in our community. So let's go back to the inventory list and break that down a bit. What do I, what do I exactly mean by that? Sometimes you have your obvious locations, such as your county museum, but Sometimes we have tourism assets in our communities that, that may be sleeping. Um, they're there, but no one is promoting them. Maybe no one has the staffing to have them open or the money to promote them. There could be many different reasons, but let's identify them. And then we can try to figure out how we can kind of wake them up down the road. Um, I actually had a guy who came to me shortly after uh, I became tourism director and said, Trish, you got to save these one room schools. Um, they are not going to be around much longer and you need to tell that story. And, and he was absolutely right. But what I didn't know was we already had a one room schoolhouse preserved and he didn't know that either. It just took someone to give it a voice and someone to promote it. And that's our decline schooler here. It's our little schoolhouse. And we actually have folks still in our communities that are 80 and older that remember going to school here. And, and some of them spoke German and didn't even learn English until they came to this school here. So we have a great story that wasn't being told here that now we can tell. So where can people visit? Where are your museums or places that are telling your story? Is it your county museum? Is it a country school? 
Or maybe it's a church that no longer holds regular services. Here are a couple of our cultural sites. Now we are very proud of our German ancestry here in Perry County. And we have pockets of German immigrants from Bavaria, Baden, Saxon that settled in Perry County. So we can actually tell three different stories. But Perry County is home to one of the largest organized immigration of our Saxon Germans in 1838. And our Lutheran Heritage Center and Museum in Altenburg do a remarkable job of professionally sharing their culture and history with thousands of visitors each year. We also have the Saxon Lutheran Memorial that has the preserved logged homes built by these immigrants. And it is a living history museum that you can walk through. And I really love pairing them together because they're both so unique in how they tell the story. Um, but just to get to visit both of them, you get the best of both worlds in trying to understand their lives back in the early 1800s and just how difficult it was to settle Missouri. What does your community have in terms of veterans memorials or military sites? And that could be from any era. Perry County doesn't have any battlefields, but we do have some beautiful military museums and memorials. Um, one of our local Perry County Military History Museum is one, and the other is the Missouri's National Veterans Memorial. We only built the Veterans Memorial less than five years ago, and the funding came from a local resident. So when you start working with your heritage tourism and your community can see the value in the way that your community is preserving and promoting its history, really amazing things can happen. What do you have for historical homes or buildings? Um, the Faraday House here is our only historical home. It is actually the oldest resident home or residential home in Perryville, telling the history of the family or families that lived here and how our city grew is really important to us. Uh, little things like how did Spring Street get its name and how the town city limits was only two houses away. So do you have any historic buildings that you can give a voice to? Maybe it's something as easy as a walking tour around your downtown, or you have an old mill site, maybe an old theater or an old general store. Um, they're there, maybe they're just sleeping. Religion is in every community because every community had a church. Um, they are the heartbeat of our communities. Some of our best kept records are from church records. So how can we incorporate your local churches into heritage tourism? Now this here is the national shrine of Our Lady of Miraculous Medal and they have been welcoming visitors since 1818 to Perryville. Churches can be a part of an immigration tour, a settlement tour, or a religious history tour. And this particular church here could even be part of an art tour with its beautiful paintings and the bronze and marble statues that they have. What do you have in terms of natural areas in your community. Do you have a state park or a national park? Um, Perry County, we do not have a state park. We do not have a national park, but we have some really great natural areas that are managed by our Missouri Department of Conservation. And you may have some great areas that are kept by your local government, promote them. If you have, a beautiful, if you have beautiful landscapes, or river walks, um, unique outdoor sites, use them to your advantage. Families, especially those with children, 
loved the scenic and historical locations. Um, it could have been maybe one of the main reasons that your area was settled. Tell that story. Was it maybe because of the river or a mineral spring or a railroad? Um, we find more and more that as the urban population grows, our rural areas are more attractive and more desirable to visit. And they love these little hidden gems. It really makes them feel like explorers. So let's get some partners. Um, maybe I should have told you all that I am a one person office, but I will always, always tell you that I do not do anything on my own. It just isn't sustainable. Um, you can be the voice and you can be the one who keeps the ball moving, but we always need partners. And that can be a real struggle, especially for our rural communities. So once you have your inventory list compiled as best you can, because it's kind of like genealogy, it's never done, um, then you can start thinking about bringing in many of those people bringing them together along with other partners in the tourism field, such as your hotel people, your restaurants, campgrounds, who are your partners and how can you help each other? This is what I would call my advisory council. And I bring all these people together and we meet quarterly. Not everyone comes all the time and some have never come, but you know, that's okay. But for those who do, it gives them an opportunity to have a voice in the community, to network with other like-minded tourism people, um, and, it, and also an opportunity to collaborate on tours and events. So it's a place where they can share what's going on in their sites. They get information on other places in their community. They have a real voice to tell their concerns or their, their hardships. Um, and then as a team, then we can help figure out solutions. I would also encourage you to invite your city or your county leaders to these meetings as well, because a lot of times they can, they can play a huge part in, in getting things further down the line. And outside of this council, I would encourage you to get involved with your community groups, such as your Main Street program or downtown revitalization groups or your chambers because you're all working to promote the same area. So now that we have our heritage inventory, how can we create opportunities? How can you turn that into tourism? The first tour that I created was on our county courthouse. Our courthouse is the crown jewel of our community has tons of history, and it has a great view of our city from the clock and bell tower. We, we talk about its architecture, its construction, uh, some of the first court cases that were held in our courtroom, and our courthouse being located in the historic downtown, it also gives us an opportunity to promote businesses for downtown shopping, eating, and sleeping. Now, a tour like this is great for schools, boys and Girl Scouts, um, many other adult groups looking for tours. Our courthouse is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and you would be surprised at the local pride it creates in a community. So if you have the opportunity, um, make your courthouse something really special in your town. Can you create any trails in your community? Our Christmas Country Church Tour is in its 17th year. We started out with six churches. Five years ago, we had 22 churches participating. This year, it will consist of nearly 40 century old country churches of all denominations. This is a two day event that promotes rural communities, their culture, 
their history and their tradition focused around Christmas. Um, we promote everything from our German Lutheran Tannenbaums or Christmas trees, um, all the way to our Scott Irish handmade plaid tartan ornaments uh, that hang on the tree at the Brazel Presbyterian Church. We, we highly encourage our church volunteers to promote their history and heritage right down to the music and the refreshments of homemade cookies that is usually made by someone's great grandma within the congregation. Now, remember I said that earlier that churches are the heartbeat of a community. And during this seasonal tour, we really give visitors in some of our smallest communities, um, communities that may not even exist anymore. All that is left is the church that opens up for this event. It's quite special. The Perry County Barn Quilt Trail was created about four years ago. We started with less than 20 barns, um, and now we're at nearly 60. Uh, this, like the church tour, is a multi-county tour. We span four counties, and if you're not afraid to grow beyond your city or county lines, your tours will be stronger, and you will have more partners. Uh, this tour, the Barn Quilt Tour, has created a relationship between our rural farmers and our tourism program. They can now relate to tourism because they're a part of it, and they're very proud of that. Be aware of what is unique in your area. So Perry County has a vast and unique car system. We have a lot of caves and we are home to an endangered cave fish found only in Perry County known as the Grotto Sculpin. Now our cave system doesn't um, allow us the opportunity to market ourselves like other public caves in Missouri, but we have been able to create a new cave experience called Wild Caving that allows us to share the experience of our cave system with others. About three years ago, we started to promote our underground a bit more with specialized cave classes promoting the history, the health, and the education of our car system. Um, if the water quality here is found, that, that's found here in our caves is good for our Grotto Sculpin cave fish, then we know that the water quality is good for the people who live here. So we talk about our ecosystem and the environment it supports beneath us. So let's talk about weird or funny things that people would want to see. Do you have anything odd in your community? Here in Perry County, we have the shoe tree. Um, its official name is the Hadler shoe tree. It's named after the family who started the tradition. And basically they, they throw shoes in, tr in this tree. They put up a sign, they welcome throwers to the tree. Um, I'm not sure when the shoe tree was started, but it was, it's been longer than 20 years. And it's located on the edge of a county, uh, public county road. And people just go there and, and throw shoes up in it all the time for no particular reason. Um, they just love to throw old pairs of shoes up there. Uh, it's lots of fun for kids of all ages. And they've even created many different styles of throws that have been um, done. You, you have the overhanded and the underhanded, the wind up, the whip, and, and it's just a lot of fun and there's really no meaning to it, but you would be surprised how many people ask where this is located. And the picture up in the, the top with the road, um, that was taken by a St. Louis photographer who came down here just, just to take pictures and photograph the tree. So this is not typically what I promote on our tours, but it is a fun stop 
uh, and then people do inquire about it. So it's, it's the quirky things sometimes that will draw people. So don't be afraid of, of odd or quirky. This is the old Appleton Bridge. This Iron Trust Bridge built in 1879 is the only bridge of its kind that we know of in Missouri that is still in its original location. Um, so do you have any bridges or towers um, in your area that you can tell a story about? Uh, we don't only talk about the bridge, but we talk about the mill that is no longer there and how it served the community, uh, the Apple Creek, as well as the Native Americans that made their settlement next to it. And then of course, the melting pot of immigrants that made Old Appleton, the Old Appleton community, um, a, an early commerce hub. Uh, the bridge was actually a gateway for travelers here for many years. Um, but today it is uh, a bridge that only allows foot traffic and it's promoted to our cyclers and to sightseers who are following the Great River Road. We're also um, currently exploring options to put in a boat ramp above the bridge to allow easy access to the, the creek waters for our many kayakers and canoers that float the Apple Creek. Um, we're hoping that this will enhance the small park that's here and hopefully lead to more signage of history in the area and possibly a small interpretive center. So we have great hopes of our, of our bridge location here. So we've discovered that we have some great sites to share, but you know, maybe they're not enough to keep people busy the entire day. So how can we get them to spend more time with us? Uh, that's where your itinerary comes in. Bundle sites together to create a schedule of things for people to do. And don't, to, uh, don't forget to incorporate uh, your favorite food stops or destination restaurants in that. Consider creating workshops or small conventions that allow you to showcase your city or sites. It could be an immigration conference, a genealogy conference, a cultural or historical workshop specific to your area um, that can draw people with a common interest. And this allows you to weave in your museums, churches, your cultural sites, your restaurants, um, and just create a really great experience for them. Our Lutheran Heritage Center and Museum in Altenburg are pros at this. They have an international conference every other year and they bring genealogists into our area who are researching their roots. Or for instance, if you host one of the Missouri Humanities Heritage Workshops in the future, Make sure if you attract any out of town participants that you give them a list of other things they can do while they're here and encourage them to spend more time either before or after the workshop. Don't forget about your park and recreational areas. Make sure to include a natural area for recreation or relaxation if you're planning uh, schedules. This is Legion Lake and it was always popular to with our locals for summer fishing, but about eight or nine years ago, the Department of Conservation started stocking it with uh, rainbow trout for winter fishing. And now we have folks that travel to our area just to winter fish. Maybe you have some Missouri Century Farms or agritourism farms to promote. We have a wedding venue business that plants a sunflower field. And then we also have a local pumpkin farm that besides just selling pumpkins, they give families uh, a real farm experience with a wagon ride, straw mazes, 
and they actually explain how the farm works. And then um, much to our surprise, the National Shrine planted a full field of zinnias and it literally blew up their social media. And we had people coming into town just to take pictures of the zinnia field. So support and promote agriculture in your area. Um, we actually have a couple other sites that are exploring other kinds of quote unquote flower fields as attractions. And I know as our uh, tourism division here, we are also working uh, with our city to design and plant some small natural areas with Missouri native plants and flowers. So this could be a huge draw. So you're mixing history with business. What historical businesses um, or buildings have been maybe repurposed in your area that you can bring in as partners? Uh, what, who can you incorporate in on your itineraries, uh, wineries or shops? Uh, this right here is a winery. Um, this winery took the, an old store and a barber shop that was operated by their family and they turned it into a winery. They have a personal history that they can share with visitors when they come. They also do a great job of promoting the tiny town that they are in, which basically only consists of a church, a museum, and a few other buildings that are only open during events here. And they, they're not far from the Mississippi River, so they also promote the river and a walking trail that's only a few miles from there. So you could go down to the river, take a small hike, come back, have some wine and some food, and it really gets people moving in our, in our county. Turning something old into something hip is what I think breweries do the best. Um, so what about any breweries in your area? So there's, there's an art of brewing craft beer there, um, but there's usually a thread of heritage or, or history each one of them have to tell. For us here, Mary Jane's Burger and Brew uh, is named after Carissa's grandmother. And she actually was um, the one who inspired and started the Christmas Country Church Tour. And she's one of our local historians. So Mary Jane is a real person in our community. Also the Jackson Street Brew Co is located on Jackson Street and they shine a huge spotlight on our historic downtown square. And then the Saxony Hill Brewery captures and promotes our Saxon German heritage every time we lift a glass. So they're all telling our heritage through their business. What do you have in the line of lodging or maybe what can you create? Eggers and Company General Store Bed and Breakfast is family owned. Uh, we were just featured in the Country Extra magazine because of their uniqueness. They took an old general store that their family owned and ran and after many years of emptiness, they turned it into a lovely bed and breakfast. People get a sense of stepping back into time when you enter the old store with the old cash register and all the shelves stocked with the items you would see in an old country store. And I'm telling you, this place is totally unplugged because they do not have any cell service. And so I wouldn't let that scare you if you don't have cell service where you would like to have a bed and breakfast. Um, the other location here, Caroline's Bicycle Hostel is another unique lodging site. Um, here we had a partnership between our tourism division and our Perry County Heritage or our Perry County Historical Society. Uh, we took an unused building, which is located in the back there, and created a two bedroom studio apartment. It has bunk beds in it. It will sleep seven to eight people. 
And cyclists get to stay on a historic property because this is where our Faraday House is located. So they get to stay on a historical property. They get to take tours and experience our historic downtown. Um, the hostel now generates revenue for the local historical society. Uh, they get to promote their historical home and the city gets more cyclists coming into the area. Another bonus of this partnership is that the tourism division is able to use this space for free to bring in influencers. So if I have a blogger, a photographer, writer, film crews, et cetera, if they are promoting our area through something that they are doing, then we can use this space for free. And it's a great partnership. Here's another example of using history in your buildings to build heritage in your community. So this partnership came with our economic development, our tourism division, and a private tractor collector. We took a 1950s implement building that had set, sat empty for many years and turned it into a commercial shared space for offices and an antique tractor museum. Uh, in partnership, we also created the Perryville Welcome Center and our offices, Monday through Friday, eight to five, we help keep the museum open to visitors on our normal work week, saving them volunteer hours and staff. This building is three blocks off of our courthouse square. So, so now we're stretching our downtown for visitors to explore. We, we opened in March of 2020 and literally we shut down one week later because of the COVID pandemic. But we reopened in May of 2020 and today all five of our offices are fully utilized and the American Tractor Museum sees visitors every day. Also our Perryville Welcome Center, which has an information hub with all of our brochures and stuff in it um, and a gift shop promotes local artisans to create that unique flavor of Perry County gifts locally made. So look for opportunities to partner with government and businesses, but also look at local collectors and artists to partner with as well. So how are some things for us to get our story out? By partnering with um, the city of Perryville, we have been able to create some pretty cool murals to share our story. The city of Perryville had no public art in the city and I needed a way to share our story. So by looking at these murals, there are many things that they tell us about our community. Our, our main focus for starting the mural project was to really dress up some not so pretty buildings that some of our downtowns um, all have. And it's been quite successful. We now have some beautiful buildings, a very proud community. We've got a lot of community interaction with this. Um, the city now has public art. And we now remind and share our history with uh, the passing of each car going up and down our streets. Creating trails through your community gets people involved in your community. Uh, these are some sculptures that we installed just last month in May. It's our first year for sculptures and I was really surprised at the artist who wanted their pieces displayed in such a small town. Remember, we're a city of 9,000 people. Um, it also helps us to expand our tourism efforts uh, to others, mixing the old with the new and supporting art in our community. To work some new art in with the history, this summer, we will be installing a historical marker for Charles Lindbergh, who barnstormed here in Perryville. He made friends here, and we are simply celebrating that. 
The seminary picnic grove that I mentioned earlier that has the 120th um, anniversary coming up this year um, is where Charles Lindbergh would land his plane when he visited Perryville. It was, it's basically a cow pasture. And since we have this reoccurring annual picnic tradition, the site has never changed. It is literally still a field. So we will be giving people the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Perryville's connection with Charles Lindbergh and this field as they are able to imagine Lindbergh landing here in the 1920s. So think about what threads of history you can tap into that people may not know, or maybe they've just forgotten. So if you need help, your local historical societies or even your military organizations are really great resources for that. So if you're not able to design or create murals and sculptures, let's talk about how we can promote ourselves without having any money, which when I started our tourism program here, we had a very tiny budget for me to promote our entire county. Um, and advertising is always changing, it's always evolving, and it's really tough to stay caught up, much less to stay on top of the latest social media platforms. So if you are not media savvy, I'm telling you, you're not alone. Um, we have to really think creatively. You really need to know your audience. And if it means just educating one person at a time, then that's where we start. So here are some things that I done and that I still do and they are free. So volunteer to write a monthly column for your local newspaper. Um, some people here think that I work for the newspaper. I do not work for the newspaper, but I'm always willing to do something for the newspaper. Um, submit articles or community happenings in other newspapers. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to stay in your community. Um, write or submit free articles for magazines to consider or use. Now, you don't have to be a journalist. Trust me on this. Um, create or use Facebook pages, Twitter or Instagram posting. And you don't have to boost. Boosting can come later. Just get people to like and share your comments. But I will tell you, don't post just to post. Make sure you have something to share and promote. You want it to be valued when you do have something to come across. Um, and it doesn't have to be every day. Uh, try to post something on a regular basis, but maybe it's just once a week. Consider entering in a photo or calendar contest. We all have beautiful pictures that we get lucky at capturing once in a while. Um, let's show some of those if you can. Register your event or site on free community calendars. And if you can get flyers, and you can get something made up. Where are your audience? Can you put those flyers for events or tours in senior centers, libraries, government bulletin boards or restaurants? And then this is how our church tour started out. We advertised grassroots all the way. It started out advertising in nothing but church bulletins. So if you can get something in a church bulletin, um, that would be a great resource as well. Local radio, um, volunteer to do some community news or event interviews, tell, tell people what's going on in your area, and then consider volunteering for talks or presentations um, at community organizations such as your Rotary, Kiwanis, chamber lunches or meetings, bank power lunches, you can do 4-H or school groups. Just ask around and see what's in your area and even your neighboring communities. A lot of times people are looking for programs and they're curious, they just don't know who to go to. And then 
Where do you find your strength? Do your inventory, identify what you do and do not have. Go ahead and build an itinerary, create you some kind of a tourism guide or a brochure, a roadmap or something for uh, visits for your guest. Create your tours, trails and events supporting your heritage, looping in any festivals or events that you can um, collaborate with and initiate and conduct advisory council meetings. Uh, give your heritage sites and your tourism entities a table where they can help one another. Cultural sites, museums, lodging, restaurants, and shops. A rule that I always go by, and it's my own made rule, but um, if you think they are tourism, invite them to the table. If they think they are tourism, welcome them to the table because these people are your ambassadors. Um, the people who run your lodging establishments, your wineries, your breweries, your taverns, um, the restaurants and parks and natural areas, they, they can and they may already be helping you share and spread the history of your local immigration, your Native American history, your African American history, religious or military history. And I will leave you with this one last thought. Consider conducting local ambassador training. Um, you may have people in your area that were raised there, but they don't know the general history and they may volunteer in your community. Um, they are not from the area, but are open to business there. Uh, maybe they purchased property or a building not knowing the history, or they work here but they're not from the area and they want to provide more to their customers. Um, and these can be done through your local historical society or your tourism program. So with that, I want to thank you for your time. And I hope there were some nuggets of information in there that can help you grow your heritage tourism program in your special area. Caitlin? Thank you so much, Trish. That was excellent. Um, we do have a couple questions. Uh, so Marcy asks, um, you mentioned uh, quite a few examples of how much Perry County relies on their religious history and um, the, the historic churches. So Marcy asks, how do you get your religious community and churches to buy into being partners in tourism and opening their properties for visitors to visit? They're such great resources, but can be hard to approach. We have, yeah, um, our Christmas Country Church Tour um, gives our churches an opportunity to tell their story. And, and the churches have to want to tell their story of, um, of where they came from and how they settled the area. And we have, I guess we've been really fortunate that we have so many people that, that really wanted that outlet to tell that story too. I would start approaching um, people within the churches and just ask them about an event or a day where they would want to have an open house or some kind of a, you know, a special event where people can go in um, and just see what their churches look like. It's very simple. I mean, you know, we decorate for Christmas, but it doesn't have to be for Christmas, so. Um, this is, I'm glad someone brought this up. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit about um, Perry County and the 2017 eclipse and how you guys <laughs> use that to your advantage. I think that that's a great thing to bring up. I mean, using such a huge historical event that has national, international significance um, and we, you just happened to get lucky in that you were right smack dab on the path. So uh, how did you guys market that to your advantage and how far in advance? I know some people started that years in advance. Yeah. Um, 2017 eclipse was an animal that no one um, had ever experienced before. So it was really going into the unknown. Um, the event is, it's, got a different um, emotional thing to it because of the event itself. So uh, 
we just, we knew people were going to come to our area. So we really worked hard with a task force and we just really wanted to prepare our community. One thing that we did focus a lot on was the eclipse was just a one day event. Um, and, and that is true, but we wanted to make it more than a one day event. We wanted to make it more than a weekend festival. Uh, we wanted to really let people come into our community, hoping that we could show them all the other museums and the cultural sites and stuff that we had so that they, after the big event of the eclipse, that they would want to come back and spend more time in our area. And, and it worked, it really did. Um, we've already started planning for the 2024. I will tell um, my Missouri people here, if you are in the path of the eclipse in 2024, get a hold of me because we, we have formed the task force already and we are starting that, that pre-planning. But I mean, it, we really did try to focus on what we had here before the eclipse even happened. I think that that's, that's such the, that's so much the key is, um, not marketing yourselves as just the place where the eclipse is going to be the coolest, but you know, obviously that's why people are going to come. So you don't need to, you don't need to talk about that as much, you know, that's the draw, but as you're leading up to that, you're talking about all the other great things and you're getting them interested in choosing Perryville, Perry County as their place to watch it. Because I mean, I know Missouri had people from all over the country that came and stayed to watch the eclipse. So I think it was, you know, the fact that you started your marketing early and you were marketing the other assets you had so that when people actually came there, they were planning a longer trip because they knew that there were going to be other things to do as well. Um, so I think that was genius. And I'm glad you brought up the 2024 because I was going to say, isn't there another one coming up in a couple of years that has, I don't know if it's the same route, but it's a similar, there's, it's hitting similar communities. Um, so, yeah. It, so, it's so I think that, out this time. yeah, but, yeah. But so, there, but there again, Caitlin, we didn't use a ton of money in marketing. We, we had a, a couple really good um, avenues. Uh, we had our Facebook, we had our website and, and we let so many, we tr really tried to educate our community on what it was. And they in turn went out and they were our roaming ambassadors for this. So, and that's what yeah. we try to do in our heritage tourism as well. Well, I think the eclipse tends to market itself. I mean, if I remember people just Googling what the path was and you could just pick some place on the path. So I think at that point, it's, it's making sure that your social media pages are looking good. It's making sure your website's looking good. Um, so that, you know, if people are like, Hmm, where do I want to stay? They Google you and they see a killer website or they see that, you know, they look on your community calendar and see that you've got other events planned. Um, you know, I think that that's really the key is just making sure that, yeah, like you said, maybe you don't spend a ton of marketing dollars on it, but, but your town is ready and, you know, to show off that you guys are the place to be. Um, so that's great. I, I'm really, you know, happy that you guys get to experience all that again in a few years. Um, Michelle asks, with the murals and the sculptures that you guys did, how was all of that funded? So I partnered with, like I said, um, the city kind of had a checklist that they go through periodically on, on what a city has and what, it's, what it maybe needs to work on. And public art definitely was something that we were lacking in Perryville. We had no public art. And so that was something that they really wanted um, us to partner on. And so much of the funding did come uh, from, from the city, but it wasn't a ton of money. I mean, our, our budgets were anywhere from 6,000 to, to 10,000 per, per mural. Um, but I mean, the community um, positivity that came out of it um, was huge for the city and uh, we're looking forward to doing more as well as the sculptures. Mm -hmm. Now I have been able to, um, to fund some of the sculpture stuff um, since we have a transient tax that went through. But it's also leading up to our Lindbergh sculpture, which we are actually growing more of a walking trail um, of art and history um, through our community. So those are just little pieces, uh, little dots that we're connecting now through our city. Mm -hmm. 
And I think too, um, art projects can be really hard to find grants for. Um, I know that, you know, Missouri Humanities, you know, we, we have to, you know, we're, we're a granting agency and we have to separate the art and the humanities sometimes. Um, but I think it all depends too, like if you're looking to apply for a grant or get some sponsorships, um, it's not so much about selling it as just art. It's about talking about why it's beneficial to your community to have something like this. What is it, you know, what stories are they telling and, and where are some other examples of communities where this has been successful? I mean, for example, in Missouri, I know Cape Girardeau's murals are a huge tourist attraction down there and have been for several, several years. So um, I think, you know, as far as securing funding for a project like that, you know, no, you're not just looking to hire an artist and buy some paint and paintbrushes and, and materials. You are, you're, you're building a story and you're attracting tourism, which means money, which means community development. I mean, you, it's, you have to look at the bigger picture. And I think that that's important to think of when, you know, you, maybe you aren't so lucky to have the city put in their budget dollars for a project like that. Um, but so these, something to and, consider. And I think it's important too, that the murals that we put up, they also are going to be there for 10 years. Um, so if you're talking, you know, $6,000 to do a side of a building for 10 years, you know, that that's a little easier to um, uh, quantify, mm -hmm. you know, as far as the tourism that's coming into your town. Right. Um, we have a few more minutes left. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to submit those. Um, I wanted to just call back on a couple of things that Trish said and, and put some extra stress on them. One thing being this idea of creating an inventory um, that's something that has come up in each of our presentations today. Uh, Lori talked about it this morning when they're talking about their Find Your MO program. Uh, Marcy talked about it during the Highway 36 Heritage Alliance. And of course, Trish is talking about it when it came to her, her county project. So um, obviously this idea of creating an inventory is, is, I would say the number one takeaway of this whole workshop is to just know what you have to offer. You know, when you're talking about wanting to use heritage tourism or really any tourism, it doesn't just have to be calling upon your community's, you know, cultural heritage. But when you're talking about tourism, you're talking about attracting people, you can't get anywhere without knowing what you have to offer. So the number one takeaway from today I would say as somebody who watched all three, obviously, is, is this idea of creating an inventory. And it is a free, you know, first step. You know, it's, it's not gonna cost you a cent except some time. Um, and I think not just creating the inventory, but the importance of doing it with other people. Um, obviously, Trish wasn't the only one that sat down and, and thought about every building in Perry County. It was, you know, it's a group effort. And I think also the importance of, of bringing in all kinds of community members, you know, so you have different perspectives of what people see as an attraction or see as something worth exploring or, or marketing or, and Trish, I loved how you use the verbiage of um, assets that might be sleepy and how to wake them or sleeping and how to wake them up. I think, you know, the more people, the more industries you can represent when you're getting together and creating your, your inventory for tourism, the better and the more perspectives you're going to have. So um, I highly encourage all of you uh, who maybe represent an organization or a community to, to start there if you're looking for a place to start. Um, and again, I think too, it's, you know, finding, uh, you know, anything that can be perceived as tourism because um, you never know who may find it interesting. You never know what someone's going to be interested in. Um, we do have a question from Michelle. We have struggled with our advisory committee attendance. Trish, logistically, how does that work on your end? Do you all go around Robin in a room and have each partner talk about what they're go what's going on in their lane? Do you give them tips or your plans for that quarter, et cetera? Um, what do you think, Trish? Well, it, it depends. Um, yes, we, my uh, city administrator, um, I also am blessed that every now and then I have a county commissioner that will attend these as well. Um, but I basically go through and talk about the things that tourism is doing to help them, uh, things that I have in the works, um, advertising that we're doing. And then we do go around the room and let each um, member tell us, you know, what, what they have going on maybe what their struggles are, things that have worked for them. Um, but it's basically, we just, it's just keeping us all kind of centered um, and working together instead of everybody kind of doing their own thing and, 
and nobody really knowing um, what the other one is doing. And it can be challenging at times. I've had meetings where two people have showed up and I've had meetings where, you know, I have a full house. So, you know, it just, it, it kind of, I, as tourism, I give them the opportunity to come to the table um, and to have that voice there. Don't give up. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we are right at four o'clock and that was perfect timing um, for our last question. Um, thank you to everybody that uh, submitted questions and comments. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. Trish, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, you know, today worked out nicely in that our first presentation kind of was a, a bird's eye view of tourism in Missouri. And we focused in a little bit on with Marcy, with our Highway 36 Heritage Alliance, talking about a regional effort and then focusing even farther in on a county effort, which, you know, obviously with Perry County Heritage Tourism. So I really hope that everybody uh, was kind of able to get so many different examples of, of uh, tourism efforts at every scale. So um, I hope you guys are walking away with some resources, with some ideas, with some to-do lists. Um, we hope to continue to offer workshops, um, you know, as the year goes on. So stay tuned to Missouri Humanities social media. Um, sign up on our website to receive our newsletter for um, upcoming programs and events. Uh, we do stuff like this all the time. So uh, we highly encourage you to stay involved and stay in contact with us. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and end our day. Please stay tuned to Zoom just for an extra minute to get that survey link and fill that out for us. I'm sure Trish would love to hear some feedback. I always love to hear the feedback too. Um, Trish, thank you again. And everybody, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.